Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, Three Ways to Jumpstart Your DevOps Practice. Today I'm joined by Tim Curvis, Senior DevOps Engineer here at AHEAD. In this webinar, Tim will discuss the importance of breaking down silos and shifting your company culture to achieve DevOps transformation, along with the benefits of starting a DevOps dojo within your organization. I'll also give you an overview of the enterprise DevOps tool chain and how to deliver more frequent releases, faster issue resolution, and reduce time to provision new services. Before I turn things over to Tim, I just wanted to mention a few housekeeping items. We do want to hear your questions, but we'll do the Q&A at the end of the session. If you have questions throughout, submit them using the appropriate tab on your BrightTalk screen. Also, we'll be posting some live polls throughout the presentation so we'd appreciate if you would chime in with your responses as those poll questions pop up. All right, so without further delay, let me turn things over to our speaker, Tim. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, hope to keep this uh, as useful as possible for everyone, but really we want to kind of focus on uh, the main things we're seeing in the DevOps space uh, with respect to some of our enterprise customers and how how we think some of these things can value um, everyone and, and the community as a whole. So uh, without delay, we'll get started. Uh, first, I just by way of introducing AHEAD, I want to kind of cover how we got here. So AHEAD is about an 11-year-old company, and um, we've evolved a long, long way since then. Um, however, we're, we're definitely true to our infrastructure roots. Um, a lot of us came out of the infrastructure space and really began automating things that were um, kind of the traditional blocking and tackling of uh, compute network and storage inside of a data center. And it has since then evolved into the cloud space, into the DevOps space, and into security. So um, it's, again, back to our roots, a lot of, a lot of this comes out of uh, a long history of automating things in the data center and um, makes a natural transition to the software development space. So I think you'll see some of that uh, throughout this presentation. But if any of this looks uh, you know, relevant to you, it's something we're happy to talk more about. So what is DevOps? I think we get, up, get this out of the way first. Uh, you know, obviously everyone has a little bit different definition, but to us, DevOps is about uh, really number one and first and foremost, getting more information from your customers, whoever they might be, uh, back to your developers so that they can improve the amount of uh, time and or improve the time it takes them to get features back um, and really to you know, delight their customers. Um, the other thing is, you know, developers spend a ton of time preparing environments, build environments, workstations, that sort of thing. Um, we would really like to improve the amount of time that developers have um, focused on writing code, which is really what we're all here for, what developers are here for, I should say. Um, so that's, that's the main thing, is really creating this feedback loop. Uh, and, and to accomplish that, we really look at this delivery pipeline, um, which a lot of you have probably seen and, and are starting to familiarize yourselves with. But, uh, the idea of you know automating the build, test, and release cycle, but also getting uh, planning and monitoring feedback uh, from our users, our business, and and all of the pieces that make up our customer. So, who practices DevOps? I mean, the answer here is everyone. Uh, it's not just developers. Um, Adam Jacobs from Chef is is fond of kind of using the comic book or uh, superhero reference, which I like as well. And it's this idea that we're not turning everyone into a bunch of generalists. We're really uh, supporting and fostering growth to be uh, you know, really specializing in certain areas, but being well connected in a, in a certain uh, outcome, right? So um, the idea is we all have unique skills, but we're all coming together to build a product or, or build something that will you know, make our customers really, really happy and um, be the next cool thing. So that's kind of the mantra that we have going into this. The uh, symptoms, because you know, we're kind of focusing on failure and failure being a good thing and learning from our failures and how we can move things along. But I think um, the main symptoms we're seeing of a stalled DevOps movement and in some cases a um, never got started DevOps movement are, are things like you see here. So uh, fear of failure, um, not wanting to fail in front of peers or, or in the marketplace. Um, certainly the hair on fire idea that we're spending way too much time putting fires out and, and fixing problems. We just don't have time to innovate and do new things and um, really create new ways of doing things. Uh, the idea of a path implementation going poorly, leaving a sour taste in our mouth, or in many cases our executives' mouths, um, and being you know, fearful of trying too much that's new um, based on those past experiences. 
Um, lack of a well-defined success criteria. Sometimes that's not a bad thing. It just helps us get going, um, you, know, you know, and just learn. Uh, that can sometimes generate momentum on its own. Uh, silos, certainly we want to break those down as it makes sense. Um, not having security in the mix uh, is something we'll talk about as being really important to, to fix. And um, certainly the, de the DevSecOps, you know, shifting security left is um, a big push these days. Um, lack of version control and just lots of manual, uh, manual processes. Um, so our first poll I think we had out there that I just want to go through quickly is um, really in the, the beginning of this sense, what you're what you're doing in terms of DevOps and what everyone's doing. So um, it looks like uh, most of our, our viewers are kind of in the beginner cursory knowledge uh, landscape, which is very, very common with, with what we're seeing in, in our customers. I think it's um, really trying to figure out how to get to the next step and even maybe before that, what the next step is. So um, certainly everyone has a sense of what it is uh, it's, and it's getting into that 201, 301, 401 kind of level of how do we put a plan together and how do we move forward. So why do we need to jumpstart? Um, I mean, there's three kind of main areas uh, that we see DevOps being a benefit to, and um, certainly the first being the business. Um, you know, we want to reach new customers. A, a lot of us or all of us have this thought that, you know, as, as um, the consumer landscape changes, we really want to reach new customers and new generations of customers, and that helps us be successful as a business. Uh, and to do that, we need to generate not only new features, but even new pathways to customers. Um, certainly organizational readiness, so the idea of DevOps being a catalyst for organizational change in a really positive way. Um, and then just the speed to market aspect, so the idea of delivering things faster than our competitors. On the cultural side and how DevOps can help, it's, it's simplifying. You know, we have a lot of large business uh, applications that uh, people, it takes, takes armies of people to support. Uh, whenever there's a problem, we get the quintessential war room and um, people losing sleep, and, and you know, there's some uh, aspects of, of DevOps that can help us alleviate that, um, or at least that's the hope, and that's what we're seeing in the higher functioning DevOps teams. Um, we want to improve communication across not only the business, but uh, in our, our, um, uh, the community that we operate in as well as our customers, and in some cases, breaking down and, and having the teams work in a more DevOps fashion lets, lets the communication flow improve. And um, just the, the empowering our, our folks, you know, from a transformational standpoint, um, one thing that people are really finding more than ever now is the idea of attracting talent. So, um, you know, companies want to be seen as doing things that are just as cool, if not cooler, than, than the Facebooks, the Netflix, you know, those types of companies. Um, and really, you know, attracting that new talent is what... Uh, um, gives us the most innovation drive, and I think it's a it's a continual loop back and forth because those people, you know, working at our organization, we want to make sure they're feeling enriched and um, giving them opportunities to feel empowered for why we're doing something and what we're trying to accomplish. And the third area being operations, of course, um, lots of manual processes today. So the more of this stuff we can automate, and the more we can then spend our time on automation. Um, the less we're doing, you know, late night break fix work and um, rolling out releases manually in the middle of a Saturday and, and that type of thing. Um, certainly increasing security and improving security posture. Um, the more we automate, the more we can uh, seamlessly provide factual information to our auditors that say, yes, we're following these uh, frameworks that we need to follow, um, and, and really just controlling costs. And this is particularly important as we move to a consumption-based economics model for things like the public cloud. Um, we, we need to control cost in, in build environments and dev environments. And uh, the old mindset of having six VMs times 80 developers is just very difficult when they're not used 24 by 7. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine paying for that in the public cloud. So um, some of these processes we'll talk about are really aimed at uh, alleviating that aspect of it. So the solution for AHEAD and what we you know, have been espousing to our customers is really a, a two-part solution. And the, the first of these is really all around the DevOps enterprise tool chain. Um, this tool chain, of course, encompasses things like microservices and containers, uh, the, the move and use of the public cloud, and, and certainly automation frameworks centered around things like continuous improvement and continuous development or deployment. Uh, but in addition to the tooling process, there's this concept of the DevOps dojo. And this is really the people, culture, organizational piece of it. Um, you know, we're not the only ones, and we're certainly not the first ones to call it a DevOps dojo. 
Uh, my message is always, for every organization, this is probably going to look a little bit different than all the others out there. Uh, in some cases, we don't call it a dojo. We call it a cafe or a, um, you know, a task force. Um, in some cases, it's a physical place. In others, it's more of a, a, a virtual culture. Uh, but the point is we go through the exercise of figuring out what this should look like and how this could help us uh, and really how we practice it and iterate it over time. So the outcomes and why we're doing this you know, from a business perspective, uh, at the beginning it's, it's starting to establish a roadmap and a phased approach. This is not something that we do overnight and suddenly we're all practicing DevOps. It's the same with Agile, right? Um, so having a roadmap that naturally is a starting point and will and definitely will change over time, uh, but just starting to have that process in place that gives us the roadmap to, uh, to change and grow with. Um, well understood metrics are extremely important for this whole process and, and what that really boils down to is figuring out what these metrics are from the start and giving yourself something to measure against. Uh, if you don't look at what you're doing today and things like release time and lead time, uh, failure rate, the uh, length of time it takes you to fix failures and number of people, um, all of these things you know, should be documented today so that you can really prove to the business and yourselves what uh, DevOps is doing to improve these. Uh, and with that, more frequent releases and faster issue re resolution. So these processes that we're talking about, really uh, using the metrics to show the time and improvement and the, the dollars improvement. Um, of course, from a business standpoint, reduce time to market and provision new services. Um, we can start to look at business services rather than waiting on IT. Um, we can start to think about marketing events and um, tailoring releases of new projects, new, new software, and things like that. Um, to really come in line with a, uh, a marketing push, which of course is, is on the business side. Um, and just delivering features faster in general, which you know, the goal is not to give customers what they think they want, it's to give them things that they don't realize they ever wanted in the first place, but once they have them are extremely delighted and happy to have those. So the message here and kind of the first way of the three that we're talking about today is not to go it alone. Find somebody that um, you know, can, can bang the drum with you. And whether that's a senior leader or, you know, just other folks to create this movement, I think it starts, uh, it starts with a small splash and kind of ripples out from there. Um, the uh, idea of this culture of transformation comes from uh, the Western, uh, it should be Western, not Western, but uh, organizational culture. And this idea that um, there are facets of that uh, framework that we can apply through DevOps um, really to bring about better organizational performance and better software delivery. And put in a very modern way, again, back to Adam Jacobs, who's the CTO of Chef, um, he talks about this idea that your organizational uh, structure isn't solving your problem, it's, it's really the artifact of, your, of how you've solved your problems before. And, and what this really means is that if we try to, you know, quote unquote, do DevOps or release faster and better, but we don't change anything about our people and process and the culture, uh, our product in the end will look the same as it always has. And that's just because of a feature of our culture and a limitation of our culture in some cases. Um, so the idea of DevOps being not just the tooling and the process, but also the culture um, is, is very important to our messaging and, and what we've seen work uh, with customers in terms of actually driving uh, real change and real benefit. Um, and of course, it's not easy. Uh, so that's, that's the thing to remember. Um, we have this idea of functional organizations. This is a very classical thing. Uh, the functional organizations you, you hear a lot in, in enterprise and are really aligned towards particular technologies. So um, you hear terms like the web team, uh, the .NET team, um, the Oracle team, the SQL team. Um, those are all teams that are, are you know, a particular size and they're linked to a, a technology in general uh, or directly. And as the business uses that technology more and more and becomes dependent on it, those teams tend to grow. Um, and you end up with a lot of pockets of knowledge and a lot of um, potentially poorly documented processes. The idea to move and change culture in one way anyway is, is this idea of a market-based organization. Uh, this is where the business and the business analysts say, uh, you know, as a, as a business we're trying to produce a new mobile client or a new advertising service or whatever that may be. Um, and we form a DevOps team around this and the, the team spends a period of time really not only driving some sort of outcome that's linked to the business, but also enriching and learning uh, and sharing knowledge back to the, the IT group and the DevOps group. Um, so really the, the culture here um, changing towards this market-based alignment is, is a key indicator of success as we're uh, evolving here and beginning more and more evolution. 
so the two pizza team, I'm not going to uh, go too deep in because I think we're all starting to get sick of this, this term, but um, Jeff Bezos started this and just this idea that, uh, you know, we, we have Conway's law, which tells us that, um, you know, passive communication between um, systems, in this case, team members, um, the number of paths grow uh, much more quickly with the number of people on the team. So a team of five has 10 pathways, a team of 10 has 45 pathways, and obviously it grows quite fast from there. So um, if you want to produce something that is well-defined and, and a particular service, the idea is your team owns the requirements, you own the build, you own the support, and you run it. Um, so this ideal size being uh, a team no larger than can be fed with two pizzas. Um, and usually you want a mix of junior and senior resources rather than, um, you know, putting all senior or all junior together um, just because it helps the learning across uh, across teams that way. But then the question is, what to do next? And the idea of scaling beyond a two-piece of team, I think, um, you know, one of the first things we have to, to remind ourselves is not to grow the size of those teams into, say, a three or four or five-piece of team. Uh, in, instead, it's breaking down, so once we hit maybe 10 people, we break that into two five-person teams um, to continue the growth of, of those two pizza teams and uh, really start to create some cross-functional product ownership, um, which, you know, have outcomes that each team owns, you know, to give them a sense of empowerment and, and business context. Um, so it's very cross-functional, very business, um, you know, product aligned. Uh, one area that we see very interesting is actually from Spotify and uh, is this concept of a squad framework. And uh, certainly there are very interesting use cases to apply this. And um, you may look at this and think, well, this really wouldn't work in our, our culture. But I think the key here is that if it doesn't work um, directly and, and, you know, clearly it works exactly this way for Spotify, but uh, to look at this and take pieces back to your organization and see, you know, start to try pieces of this that might um, help start to uh, create some positive change momentum. Uh, but firstly, the, the folks are, are grouped into what are called tribes. And tribes are basically responsible for large products. So um, think of this in terms of an e-commerce site or a client player, you know, in the Spotify sense. Um, it could be a business application. And within these tribes, we have squads. And squads are basically, if you think of a microservice or uh, a particular feature, squads are aligned to uh, developing and owning and driving that, that, the success of that feature. So uh, within an e-commerce application, uh, one squad might be the, uh, the reviews team that, uh, you know, uh, handles the review service from, um, you know, the, the big data aspect of gathering reviews, also getting them from social media, and really applying that back to the, uh, the e-commerce site. And squads are uh, made up of not just developers, but they're made up of uh, a business person, um, you know, different, different levels of IT ops and even security and, and project management. Um, the idea is to give each squad their own um, self-contained, you know, unit that can, um, can create change, but can also own requirements and own outcomes. Uh, from there, we also have the idea of a chapter. This is the kind of what we have as a remnant of the, the functional teams. That is, there is still some benefit to having all of the, say, Oracle or MongoDB type practitioners, to use a couple of examples, um, still get together and share knowledge across not only squads, but tribes as well. Um, and that's how we help the organization keep a semblance of um, standards, uh, ratifying you know, new versions of things, and just helping um, really share and enable learning across, uh, you know, maybe one group has done more extensive testing in a new version of SQL Server than others have, and there's information we can share to make that process easier for everyone. Um, so that's the idea of a chapter. Um, the last one here is this idea of a guild, and a guild is, is really, really an opt-in, um, you know, interest group if you want to think of it that way. So it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter what your job function is, um, if there's a, a guild that you're interested in joining because it's something you're passionate about, it's something that you should feel like you can join and leave at any time. Um, so, you know, one might be machine learning. So, uh, you know, you may be just getting started with machine learning, not really have a clearly defined way of doing machine learning and how it can help your business, but you have people that are interested in learning more. Um, so that's a guild. They have their own sort of mes messaging system. They can um, join up and learn and do lunch and learns and webinars and that sort of thing. Um, and again, it's something they should feel empowered to come and go at any point in time. So again, lots to see here on the Spotify squad framework slide, but uh, really just want to point out certain 
pieces of this that I think everyone can find value in one or two of them. It's not the whole framework. From a cultural capability standpoint, standpoint um, Nicole Forsgren, Jez Humble, and Jean Kim uh, recently did some research on this. And the book is called Accelerate. And I, I definitely recommend taking a look. But um, it's, it's very interesting based on the research they did. But the, they found five kind of cultural capabilities that really were indicators for success in DevOps. Um, so the first being supporting a generative culture. Um, this is the idea that we're not going to squash uh, kind of innovating, uh, innovative thinking. We're going to um, you know, ask people to prove things out and prove the, the value and the effectiveness of, of new things, um, but certainly give them the freedom and flexibility to think differently and think about new ways of solving old problems. Um, and in that respect, supporting and encouraging learning. Uh, the interesting thing I saw here from, from this research group, and, and these are names we all heard of, I think, but um, this idea of encouraging learning is a lot of organizations historically and, and even today still look at learning as as a uh, investment or as a sunk cost or a cost of innovation when the real uh, the real positive is when you look at learning as um, fostering the development of a product and being kind of essential to the growth of the organization um, something you do no matter what so that's something we're, we're trying to especially with leadership talk to them about you know changing in their organization and being more uh, supportive of, of learning in general uh, supporting collaboration between teams. This is just everyone doing their part to break down silos. It, it could be as simple as setting up Slack or, or Teams so that people can talk and create channels. Um, it could be policy-based things, challenging the policy of, of different groups working in their own silos, and um, you know, just helping everyone doing their part to help break down the, the silos and, and do that basically by fostering more communication. Um, the research really found that the more people communicated, the, the more effective these teams were at producing you know, valuable business outcomes. Uh, meaningful and challenging work. You know, don't, don't give your team's work that is going through old lines of uh, you know, Fortran or something. Um, give them things that not only are a challenge, but also have a, a clear and, and uh, ex explanatory kind of link back to the business uh, value, right? And so the idea of creating an application in Java, I think, is, is the old way. And a better thing to do would be um, okay, we as a business want to produce this new feature and a new client to do X, Y, Z. Um, how, how as a group can we come together and, and think about ways to deliver this satisfactorily to our customers? Um, that's something where you're not just going and developing something, you're going and developing something with a clear link to a business outcome, um, owning kind of where you work, right? And then lastly, uh, supporting or embodying, tra embodying transformational leadership. Um, so the idea that the whole don't go it alone, right, is, um, in some cases, have a senior, or, you know, director or, or C-level kind of person that is really going to act on your behalf as an advocate, and you're going to prove and, and show success, but they're going to also market your successes throughout the leadership team, um, so that people over in finance and people over in marketing and um, just up and down the organization know um, kind of about this uh, thing that you're trying to build. Um, and then also looking at people in this movement as the leaders and the, and the thought, you know, the, the thought leadership people as um, really change agents in the organization and then giving them a platform, whether it be a promotion or um, an interest group or um, some sort of way of recognizing them uh, in their career growth. Um, you know, that type of supporting that type of, of learning and expansion and growth is really an important cultural capability for a, a high functioning DevOps team. So uh, as we continue along here, um, along the idea of fostering and learning, we have this idea of the dojo, which we talked about. Um, I've got one thing here. This is from Target, you know, certainly not something I came up with. But um, one of the, I think the most successful thing they found was this idea of a six-week challenge. And um, we have, uh, we enter the dojo with kind of a technical business product goal, and uh, we put together our own success metrics and, and share progress um, and learning and, and are supported by a team of experts. And this idea of a, of a team of uh, five or seven people coming in, um, working on a six-week engagement, you know, one thing that is interesting is for them is um, the most important thing is actually not the product of, uh, that comes out at the end. The most important thing is what folks learn as they go through this. Um, so again, not, this is something Target does. It's not something that works for everybody. But I think there are ideas in here that can help get the ball rolling for a lot of, um, a lot of teams trying to figure out how this works. Um, one thing we do see from a dojo perspective is 
some organizations just culturally can't support the idea or the financially support the idea of people coming in, into a physical space that we have to design. And for those folks, um, sometimes a task force works where uh, we do shadowing opportunities or we have a group of, of experts that go out and um, teach you know, a, a new team about a new set of processes that, that are in the DevOps model that we're building. So um, just because you say you know, a dojo and opening a dojo wouldn't work for us, there are um, other models and, and approaches to this problem. And again, um, the dojo is all about, you know, as inputs, really leadership who cares, um, the enterprise tool chain, which we'll talk about in a moment, and really the agile teams that are actors in this process that are, you know, not going to be forced to work in the traditional waterfall model, but are really going to be given some freedom to, um, to think differently and change the way we do things. And as an outcome, we have teams that have that permission to act. They've been empowered and trained on the, the enterprise context. Um, and really, they've been enabled to use the DevOps process and um, what that means and what we'll talk about, but also having kind of a panel of experts almost or a, a set of coaches that they can go back to as they go through their, their streams um, to get clarification on things. So coming into the dojo, you know, starting with the idea of framing, you should be able to, as your team comes in, have an elevator pitch you know, that you give somebody uh, like a C-level person about what you're going to have as an outcome for this project and why you should do it. Um, look at the skills that we need and, and have metrics for and what, you know, what success looks like, what good looks like. Um, come up with a team name, right? That's something kind of silly and simple that um, helps foster this idea of togetherness and um, gives you an identity within the organization, even if it is for six weeks or, or 12 weeks or whatever. Um, ask the question of whether everyone's fully committed or if this is their secondary or tertiary job. Um, this is important if you want to have success, you do have to come in and say, okay, this is what I'm working on for the next, say, six weeks. Um, really understand who cares about this and why. Is it your customers, but even beyond that, what, which customers and why would they care? What are they going to say when they see this? Um, and then the idea of kind of is this feasible, right? We shouldn't go in with something that we know from the start is going to fail. It should be, you know, based on what we've learned in the past and what we think we can do, um, we could fail, but we have a reasonable shot at succeeding and, and doing this in the time it will take. And um, no matter what, through this process, we will learn. Whether we succeed or fail, we, we will definitely learn uh, new things. Again, the uh, target dojo here is the physical space I kind of talked about. So you can see some of the things they do, um, having a common, having a, a demo lounge that at any point people can demo what they've been working on or demo the end of a sprint. Um, having an area for product discovery we'll talk about in a moment, um, and having coaches that can help with the, the, the team's tooling and the kind of under, underarching, underarching, the under, underpinning framework that we're working in. Um, and, and all of this, if this is, you know, again, if it's not feasible to have a physical space, all of these concepts can be brought to the end users or the end DevOps teams um, as sort of a task force to help them enable them. And, you know, just one of the great ways to get started, uh, you know, this goes with uh, our, our second poll here, um, you know, really around the idea of hackathons, demo days, and product planning. Um, we, you know, we see a, a real benefit not just going to conferences and doing these things, but, um, you know, to, to foster this um, idea expanding within the organization, to host, starting to host things like hackathons, um, demo days, webinars, product planning, you know, all of these things lead, they're not things that you have to jump in and practice 24 seven or, or every work day, I should say, but um, there's something that you can do like say once a quarter or once a month that even that small start will, will get the momentum going and um, adding these things as you find what works and what doesn't uh, just continues to build the momentum until you're really opening a full scale dojo, hopefully. So lastly, we kind of get here into this idea of a tool chain and uh, tool chains are interesting because the whole idea of DevOps is not to force something and um, to let people be, you know, innovative and, and think on their own. However, there's some benefit to having an enterprise supported framework because it helps people get started faster. It helps reduce tool sprawl and it helps uh, reduce you know, or uh, understand and alleviate costs from tooling. Um, so this idea that we're going for, for, forward with and, and having some success with is um, building an enterprise tool chain that gains input from a lot or all of the DevOps practitioners um, that can be formed into kind of a cogent product. 
and it's sort of like the underpinning uh, tool chain that everyone's going to start using uh, becomes a product in and of itself that has a team that supports it. Um, so the, the team supporting it is responsible not only for you know, version upgrades and, and kind of blocking and tackling, but they're also formed into coaching uh, teams that can help uh, you know, five or six or seven or eight um, you know, development teams come in and make use of these tools by doing some training, some training in the context of how we use things, uh, et cetera. And at the same time, we have this idea of product development or experimentation and choice. And the, the tool chain team has some sort of best effort, you know, not as much of a stated SLA, um, whereby if somebody says, I want to use the latest and greatest you know, container framework that we haven't looked at yet, um, they'll, they'll give some sort of best effort support around that, but it won't be part of this enterprise supported product. However, at the same time, they can prove it out and show what works. And there is some sort of process in place that um, can sort of elevate this into the, the actual supported tool chain, either as an additional tool or if it makes sense, you know, replacing an older tool or a different tool. Um, so it allows new life to continuously be breathed into this supported product, but it also uh, also allows the business to really have something that um, they can focus their time on and, and get really good at. And then lastly, it's having security underneath both of these because, you know, we need to involve security from a DevSecOps standpoint, protecting our, our crown jewels and our assets and our um, intellectual property and our business. Um, but then also the idea of, um, you know, the sandbox cannot just be, unsecured, right? I still have to have some level of security. So security has kind of the dual job of supporting both of these things in some foundational way. So one idea here is to build the field of dreams. And this, again, doesn't work for everybody, but this idea that if I build this tool chain, people will want to come use it and you can onboard folks. So it's, it's all about find, finding the approach that works for your organization. Um, so again, that kind of uh, the field of dreams idea, just creating a reference architecture. So you see here, you know, there's lots of products here, and, and, so, and they're, they're great products and all, but the, the idea here is really to focus on the, the categorical boxes you see. So um, looking at the architectural from the standpoint of, you know, do we have all of these covered? Do we have any gaps? Um, what tools do we already own that, that will work really well? Um, what tools do we maybe want to look at acquiring that will fill some of these gaps? And really, how can we start to stitch these things together? Um, I would say that's the biggest benefit ahead has brought has been really helping organizations take these great tools but really stitch them together into something that makes a, a product that provides real value um, greater than the sum of its parts in many cases. And then um, the idea of connecting pipelines is kind of an extension of that. And that is, again, coming from our infrastructure background, we're seeing lots of folks in the uh, infrastructure space that have taken orchestration tools, uh, deployment tools, things like Terraform and Realize Orchestrator, um, put you know, service catalogs on top of that, like a service now or realize automation or even just something in AWS, and coupled it with something like uh, configuration management like Puppet or Chef or Ansible. Um, there's great work being done there, but at the same time, there's great work being done by the development teams building things like a Jenkins pipeline that connects to Kubernetes that has testing tools and automation. Um, and so in, in a lot of cases, it's, it's taking stock of what we have and what the different teams are working on, improving those communication pathways, and then linking these together in a meaningful way that takes advantage of economies of scale. So rather than both teams looking at their own way to provision containers, can we leverage what the infrastructure team is doing to streamline our development and build pipelines? Uh, so this idea of connected pipelines and obviously security reaching around all of this is, is really important. Um, looking at the, the latest poll here, it's really around how many tools are you supporting? And um, you know, the overwhelming majority of, of responses are around supporting one to three tools, but letting each team kind of develop their own pipeline. And we do see that a lot. Um, however, we're, there's a, a decent, you know, 30, third or so of people that are saying um, they have kind of a more fully defined enterprise tool chain where they've looked at all the different um, categories you saw and uh, are really recommending a starting point of, of all of these tools to their, their DevOps teams. Um, certainly there's uh, great merit in both of those uh, approaches. Uh, again, here's an example tool chain, but just this idea of I've seen some folks offer like a, a, a code repo tool and a, maybe a Jenkins as a build tool and, you know, kind of leaves a lot of the pieces out like uh, testing and um, deployment and monitoring and certainly things coming back through the spectrum like uh, planning and tracking with Jira. Um, these are all things that I think a lot of times people do in their own, in their own, um, you know, units of, of development groups. 
And uh, a lot of times things like repository and test and, and feedback and, and those things are duplicated across those in many different ways. And um, I think improving the communication lets us bring these pieces together and benefit, you know, the whole organization can benefit from um, leveraging these tools in a kind of you know, more unified way. And then uh, going back again to the Accelerate work from, from Jez Humble and Gene Kim and uh, Nicole Fosgren, the management and monitoring capabilities, you know, what we see as operationally very important. Um, the the first, first thing you always hear is, I want to do blue-green or I want to do canary or I want to turn on Chaos Monkey. Um, the, there are things you need in place to kind of make that work and make it meaningful. Um, so obviously, automating change management, no developer wants to open a change ticket, um, you know, 12 times a day, much less uh, once or twice a day. Um, so we still need those change tickets to help us understand, you know, what uh, is, is changing in the environment. So the more we can automate that, the more we can make it, uh, take that headache off the developers or, or really anyone's kind of plate. Um, understanding in the organization this idea of standard changes and lightweight approvals. So knowing what, you know, in the process is so meaningless from a, a you know, impact standpoint that we just want to document it versus something that's going into production and maybe represents a more meaningful change. Um, there's a, a dividing line there that if we can say everything to the left of this is automated and, and we just look at it retrospectively if we need to, everything to the right is automated but has some sort of approval process that's very fast. Um, it, it, you know, it's something that looks different for every organization, but it's really important to go through that, that process and, and, and figure that, that framework out. Um, proactively monitoring, it, that's something that's becoming more and more common um, with some of the tools out there like Splunk and Datadog and New Relic and AppDynamics, uh, Dynatrace. You know, this idea of a user experience and understanding from top to bottom what the user sees. Um, monitoring has always been a game of trying to find the least amount of tools to get the greatest amount of coverage. <laughs> and I think, it's, I think it's refreshing to think about this problem in a new way, and that is really understand what the user sees and, and drive that into you know, actionable things we can change um, on the back end and looking at patterns as things we can automate you know, to help improve things without having to wake people up with a page at, at 2 in the morning. Um, ran, you know, uh, randomly checking system health is this idea of, of Phoenix, you know, where you're, um, you're destroying pieces of the infrastructure periodically and letting them come back. And, and um, this kind of thought and finding that if, you, if you're periodically refreshing things and the infrastructure as a whole um, stays, uh, stays more in line with how it was initially deployed and we don't have kind of the corrupt that builds up from a server running for three or five years. Um, and then managing work in progress, again, is, is biting off what you can chew, but also having to deal with the operational and firefighting, uh, making sure we keep that in, in, in even just new features, making sure um, people are managing the work in pro process so that um, things don't pile up and, and start you know, taking too much time away from focusing on one or two things that we can do better. Um, and then visualizing work and quality, I think we're seeing this this huge surge of enterprise management uh, tools and ServiceNow and JIRA and things like that um, going beyond what they originally intended, which was just documenting kind of what people are working on, to really facilitating collaboration across these teams, figuring out how, um, you know, different cycles of development and sprints have worked in the past and what can work in, uh, you know, in the future and lining that up with metrics and things like uh, build time and mean time to failure and to recovery, um, but visualizing this data on dashboards and um, letting not only the executive see it, but also each other, so that we can all kind of challenge each other to get better at it. So these are management kind of uh, operational capabilities of a, of a high functioning DevOps group. Um, touched on service management, incorporating that, but this idea of you know, updating the CMDB, updating change management, updating incidents, really being an automated process and having as much of our heuristics and self-healing and monitoring populate these tables for us. Um, but to help improve communication, because again, that was one of the key factors culturally. Um, so if it can help us drive information to the different um, areas, whether it's marketing or the help desk, um, you know, leveraging automation to improve this process flow. So we covered three ways to jumpstart your DevOps practice. Uh, one was not to go it alone, right? Find somebody that can champion this with you and, and an agent for change or, or somebody that can help support you being an agent for change. Open a DevOps dojo to help bring people together to break down silos and improve communication, learn from each other, 
be excited to come to work again and improve retention of employees. And lastly, establish an enterprise tool chain, not a dogmatic way of thinking, but a starting point um, that everyone agrees is an innovative new way of doing things that also has security support and a way to continually breathe new life into, uh, into the process. All right, Tim, so this point, thank you. This is fantastic. Um, I, we do have about five to seven minutes left for questions, so feel free to uh, submit those using the appropriate Bright Talk tab. Um, if we're not able to get your question, feel free to hit Tim up on Twitter at, at Tim Kermis, or just go ahead and submit them to contact at thinkahead.com. Um, so Tim, thanks again for a fantastic presentation. Uh, the first question that came in, what's the best piece of advice or resource you have to get team buy-in for starting a DevOps practice? I think it makes a bit of a cultural uh, difference depending on the organization I'm talking to. Um, certainly the grassroots approach where you know one team builds some momentum in their own team and then shows you know another team that's closely related. Um, that can sometimes create this process and this ball of, of snow down the mountain that um, helps bring some momentum. Um, the other one certainly is as, you know, for organizations with, uh, you know, leadership and, and even just you know, management of your team that says, you know, I'm, I'm a forward thinker and I want to improve and enrich your career. What can we do? Um, locking arms with that person and saying, I really want to go and, and start this new initiative and, you know, start small. Um, having them be also your marketing person <laughs> um, for uh, what you're trying to do in the organization can help um, get things going as well. But the biggest thing is not to do too much uh, at once, is to come up with little little changes, little things you can practice and implement that um, you know, will start the momentum uh, in a positive way. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, that's great advice just to start small. Um, Let's see, the next question that came in, how do you see the security team getting involved? Yeah, DevSecOps is big right now, but it's it's interesting because it's big in a way that uh, nobody really knows what it means yet. And there's there's some great ideas and thoughts out there, but one of the most pervasive is it's sort of becoming a little bit silly to hear all the time is the shift left security. Uh, but this is a great idea because it really talks about not just having security come in at the end and analyze your deployment, your your software, um, having them actually come in earlier, not just in testing, but also in initial design and deployments um, to really help uh, advise the team and understand both ways, you know, first, why are we doing some of these security things? They seem like a, such an impediment um, to really understand, no, these help us and these are required by, you know, the, the feds or whatever. Um, but also to take that and understand and apply it to the automation we use to deploy. So instead of security adding, you know, two months at the end because we have to go back and fix things, they add, you know, two days at the beginning while we create automation processes to address security concerns. But I think that shift left mentality is, is the most crucial thing coming out of the whole DevSecOps movement. Okay, great. Um, the next question I see um, is sort of on the flip side of team buy-in. For more non-technical folks in the C-suite, what's the best way to explain the DevOps movement along with its benefits? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I, I mean, I think the first, the what not to do is to talk about the latest and greatest toys, so to speak. Um, those are exciting, but I think you have to remember what, and, and sort of understand what the C-level and director leadership level are seeing and hearing at conferences. I think peer groups, conferences, LinkedIn, these are areas where they're getting bombarded about DevOps. And um, I think in many cases, they're already curious about DevOps because they're hearing it so much. I think the key to getting buy-in is to link it to something of value to your business. So, you know, we just made an acquisition and the acquisition is doing some really cool things and we want to bring them in as a process for doing, you know, similar things to drive faster feature release um, in, in our sort of older part of the business, I, I think is something they want to hear because, you're talking about bringing new uh, life by by taking more advantage of a uh, you know an acquisition. Um, you're also aligning it to say you know what a, an actual business outcome could be that could drive um, some success. You know whether it's revenue or stock or even just um, notoriety in the company. Definitely, and no, I think that's solid advice. Um, it looks like we have time for one more question. Uh, this one is uh, how do I deal with 
tools for all and having many competing or overlapping tools in my pipeline? Uh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a, uh, I think it's a, a fact that you're not going to get away with, especially at the beginning. Um, and I think it is even further compounded by open source and what your stance is on. Uh, you know, more and more folks are, are going away from the idea of this carp launch, thou shalt not use open source at my company. Um, you know, and so as open source becomes more tolerable and, and uh, really has become more tolerable, um, it's, you know, you have to sort of come together as a group and maybe the, the Spotify guilds are a good way to do that, but um, start to understand what others are doing and how it can help you and kind of almost as a culture vote other technologies off the island, so to speak, um, you know, that aren't fulfilling enough needs for everybody. Um, so I mean, it's a hard one, but I think, I think having the enterprise tool chain that is a product that you support um, makes people see that as a faster way to get going and a lower cost barrier to entry. And, um, you know, for that reason, they'll, they'll tend to favor taking the enterprise tool chain approach versus building their own pipeline custom in their development, you know, process um, because the ladder takes a lot more time. And I think through that, you'll start to um, hopefully save money and reduce the number of tools. Yeah, I think that's definitely a good strategy. Um, looks like we are running out of time, but um, thanks everyone for your questions. Um, thanks for your insights, Tim. Um, I encourage everyone on the line to check out the resources we've attached to this webinar. Uh, that includes more information about AHEAD's DevOps solutions and partners. Um, Tim, thanks for your time. Audience, thanks for your time. And this concludes our webinar. Thanks, everyone.